Hello, everyone. I'm Sri Srinivasan. I'm the president of SAJA, the South Asian Journalists Association. It's my honor to lead this incredible group. We represent more than a thousand journalists across the US and Canada. We like to say that means there are a thousand plus parents upset that their children became journalists. And we are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. And we have so many events planned around the country and online. And we are just grateful to everyone who's been participating with us this year. If you aren't yet a member of Saja, we'd love for you to sign up for membership. Uh, it's very affordable and uh, it's a great way to show uh, you believe in what we're doing. We also uh, are always looking for support financially. If you can donate or if you have a, a company or organization that can donate, we'd love to have you join us in uh, this adventure. As you see on the screen, this is the Saja website. We have the recording panel today. Uh, we wanna tell you about the 30th anniversary convention and gala, which is coming up. There'll be a lot of job oriented stuff, panels, workshops, all of that's coming uh, this October 11th and 12th. We're very grateful to the Craig Newmark School for hosting us uh, again. They hosted us on the 25th anniversary and we're gonna have a Friday evening reception at Icon Contemporary and then Saturday conference at Newmark, and then Saturday night reception and awards gala. Uh, we are still looking for a venue for that. So if you have any suggestions, you can let us know. President at saja.org is the best way to get in touch with us. And also on the website, you will find uh, reports of all our previous events, as well as a statement we made on student journalists covering campus protests. And you will also see photographs, and also be able to read our newsletter archive, which we send out every month. We really want your help and support, and uh, we know that we can also help you. We offer twice a, uh, twice a week office hours, Saja office hours that I host. So uh, just look in the newsletter and you can learn how we can talk about careers or anything else you'd like to chat about. We would love to do that with you. So today we have a fantastic panel that's going to be moderated by Jen Chaudhry. Jen, thank you for doing this. Jen is on the Saja board and a freelance journalist. And uh, we've assembled an all-star panel uh, to talk to Jen. And we have with us uh, Azmat Khan, who uh, runs the Lee Global Cent uh, Center on Global Journalism at Columbia Journalism School. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. We also have with us, uh, and hi, uh, Asma, thank you for being here. Uh, we also have with us Morgan Till, who's the foreign editor of the PBS NewsHour. Uh, Asma joins us from New York. Uh, we have uh, Morgan coming to us outside of DC. And Anoop Kofli is also here with us. Uh, hi, Anoop. Anoop is a former board member of Saja and uh, is the editor-in-chief of restofworld.org, which you'll hear all about. Uh, thank you to the three speakers and thank you so much to Jennifer for hosting us. I will step away and come back toward the end. We've got about 50 minutes, 55 minutes of conversation. Please use the chat as much as you can to ask questions, but also introduce yourself. There's a chance for you to meet everybody who is here today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jen. Yes, uh, thank you, Sri, for that. I'm so excited to have this conversation. I think foreign global international reporting today is rapidly changing. So I want to hear all about everyone's thoughts about that. But can we just start off? Let's uh, just talk about each of your experiences and how you even got into journalism and also international reporting. Um, uh, Asmat, maybe we should start with you. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is fantastic that you're focusing on this, and it's an honor to be here with the other panelists. I um, I actually had a slower start to journalism. So ironically enough, I teach journalism, yet I didn't go to journalism school myself. Um, in undergrad, I did political science and women's studies, and in graduate school, I continued on in women's studies. And that was actually where, as I was writing this like very thick thesis and thinking about who was going to read it that I realized like maybe three people would read that thesis. And that was just very unsettling to me. Um, but I did care about 
uncovering injustice. I cared about understanding, you know, what was happening in the world and contextualizing it. Um, and, you know, my initial thought was like, well, why don't I, I wanted to move to Pakistan and report there, but I didn't have a lot of journalism experience, any journalism experience. So what I did first was I moved back to my hometown. This was 2008 and I, which is, um, it's a town called Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I just like interned. It wasn't even a full internship because I was no longer a student, but I like had a pseudo internship at the local NBC affiliate. And because it was a an election year, um, Michigan was a battleground state until September. So there were a lot of like political campaign visits for that election year. And I like cobbled together the most like truly pathetic reel um, of different visits, things that had happened. And um and just to give you like a sense of some of the stories I was working on, there were things like, you know, rash outbreak at Comstock Park High School affects two students. So there, was, there some of it was like really fascinating. And then some of it was like lighter fare um, as one will find. But I like put together this reel and I moved to Pakistan and I essentially did something those of you who might want to move to India or Pakistan or Bangladesh right now could also do, which is I pitched myself backwards to uh, TV channels there. And I said, look, you want to cover this election. Let me help you produce coverage. I'll book you guests. I know the American political system. Check out this reel, which wasn't good, but um, it worked. And I got a job first as a producer. Um, and then I began reporting uh, and it was incredible. I, you know, if you, at that time, 2008, 2009, when I was there, Pakistan was undergoing like some very fundamental changes and transformations. Um, there was this lawyers movement at the time um, after Supreme Court justice had been deposed. Um, there were, you know, a ramping up of drone strikes in Pakistan, a subject that would later on become the focus of a lot of my reporting, like many years later as well. Um, there was just so much happening in the country. And I, I basically got to see it through the eyes of people living there, which I think is really helpful for anyone who might want to enter global reporting. Um, if you are freelancing for Western publications, you often have like a narrower set of priorities or stories that you can sometimes tell because they often have to either relate back to or be more accessible to an American or quote foreign audience. Um, and so for me, like having that opportunity to see the country through the lens of people who live there and their priorities meant that I was working on stories that wouldn't necessarily get told otherwise um, externally and were incredibly fascinating. I think it yields a richer experience. So I was there for about a year before I started getting death threats from people claiming to be Taliban, but I don't think they were. I think that I have, I have theories about what was going on there, um, but I did wind up having to leave the country. I wound up leaving the country, um, and then I, I got into the PBS series Frontline, which was sort of my journalism education in many ways, um, where I fell in love with investigative reporting, and then it sort of became my goal to kind of fuse those two things, you know, on the ground, shoe leather reporting with hard-hitting investigative journalism. Um, and that's what I've spent, you know, much of my career doing in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, um, you know, most recently investigating U.S. airstrikes and civilian casualties in those countries, um, but really thinking about accountability in war and, you know, what really happens on the ground in these places where the United States has that global footprint or sometimes just the airspace footprint. It's amazing. Um, I have a very similar <laughs> start of where I just went off to Bangladesh and try to figure it out from there. And I and I feel like so so many people get their start that way. And and I want to come back later to that conversation of like foreign stories for a Western audience. So uh, just remind me if I <laughs> if I don't get to it. But okay, Anoop, you want to tell us your origin story? Sorry, I was muted. Um. I actually very intentionally came to the United States wanting to be a journalist uh, and lied to my parents that um, I was going to study engineering. So I, I uh, came to Tennessee. I changed my major. I was uh, studying English Lit, International Affairs, um, and I had the opportunity and uh, luck to intern at Newsweek International back when Newsweek International was a thing. Um, in 2006, uh, Farid Zakaria was the editor-in-chief. 
Um, and I really enjoyed that because uh, even though I didn't have like a lot of like big bylines, I had one or two sort of those, you know, those footnotes that are so precious in magazines. I had the opportunity to interview Butros, Butros Ghali, the former UN Secretary General, you know, um, uh, report on Elie Wiesel. Um, so those were really kind of like motivating. Um, and I knew that uh, my undergrad education wasn't like going to be enough um, to get me where I wanted. Um, I really wanted to sort of cover international stories. Um, so I applied to a number of grad schools, um, ended up at Columbia. And um, this is 2007. Uh, when the term new media was, you know, the, the digital media was still new media back then. Um, and I focused on international reporting. I took classes on covering conflict, which is a class now Osma teaches um, at Columbia. And, um, uh, you know, I remember one of my one of my thesis was actually sort of uh, writing um, about Sudan. And back then, South Sudan didn't exist yet. And it was one of the class projects I'd done and really enjoyed that. I mean, one of the beauty of uh, beauty of going to Columbia is um, you actually do real reporting, right? Like my beat was Sunset Park in Brooklyn. So you're writing like real stories from the community. If you're an international class, you're actually calling analysts and people on your phone. And we use so much Skype at that time to do sort of like interna international reporting. So that was really encouraging and a big part of... Um, uh, the transition for me uh, getting into international journalism is Saja, actually. So after I finished um, my um, grad school, I got a job at the Atlantic as a digital fellow. So I moved to Washington, D.C. But I knew that, you know, my, my heart was in actually sort of like reporting. So I started applying for grants and Sa uh, Saja had a reporting fellowship. Um, and I think I saw Jigar somewhere. Jigar was the president at the time. And I shocked, I was shocked that I got one of those reporting grants alongside a reporter from the Atlantic, and I went to Afghanistan. And this is me, like never been to war, never covered war, right? Outside of the Columbia sort of walls. Um, and I was in Afghanistan and the goal was to really kind of like tell stories that other people weren't telling, right? There was so much coverage of Afghanistan in the US media, obviously. And we wanted to focus on the Canadian forces in Kandahar, right? And I was also personally interested in the role of uh, the British Gurkhas, who are these soldiers from Nepal, were fighting for the British Army, and they were in Helmand province. And I thought that would give me an opportunity to get bylines in in specific kind of like, you know, papers that don't have that kind of coverage. So I pitched a lot of places. I got um, bylines in CBC. I did like a radio piece. Um, I had photographs published in Globe and Mail. Um, I had stories published in The Atlantic. They paid me $100 for my stories from Afghanistan. Uh, those were the days. Um, so that was kind of like the beginning. And um, I later on went to The Washington Post, um, mostly working as a producer, a uh, digital producer, um, while I used a lot of my own personal time, my vacation time to, again, go back to Afghanistan. I went for the second time um, from The Washington Post. Um, and uh, I went back home to Nepal. Um, you know, th there was a historic election as the Maoists had sort of like laid down their arms and, you know, uh, come to mainstream politics. So th that was a big story. There was a lot of international interest. Um, and I used uh, Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting grants to do a lot of these reporting on my own, even though I had a full time job that had nothing to do with reporting. Right. Like that was paying the bills. I was a digital producer on the National Security and Foreign Desk. But slowly, I kind of like transitioned into sort of like writing for the post, getting bylines there. And then I accidentally get into got into editing. I think like one of the things and I don't know, like, you know, how many of your students or sort of like young journalists who are who are thinking about um, uh, you know, international reporting or working in U.S. newsrooms. But I was on a visa. I had moved from student visa to work visa. And I think like, you know, as an immigrant, especially if you're a journalist, it's really hard to really pursue what you want because you're bound by these forces that you have no control over, right? So on one hand, what I would really want is to, to, to be a foreign correspondent, right? That was the dream. But on the other hand, you couldn't really leave the US or like you, know, you had all these restrictions. So um, I, I started hearing assignment editors around me at the Washington Post talk to reporters, help shape their reporting. And that was really intriguing to me, right? That what ends up on the paper has so much to do with these people who are helping shape these things. Um, you're also caring for those people on the ground who are by themselves. And it's kind of like lonely out there. You don't know what you're doing um, you know, all the time. So I started editing and then I had an opportunity to move to BuzzFeed. 
And somehow like the most uh, Gen Z digital publication, I ended up doing the most traditional print centric work. I was like a deputy foreign editor and I was suddenly like editing correspondence. Um, we were covering ISIS and the migrant crisis um, at the time. Um, yeah, and like, you know, fast forward uh, several years, I did a brief stint in Nepal. I went back home uh, and I ran the Kathmandu Post, which was a fantastic experience. Um, and then in 2020, um, I had this opportunity to come back and build something new. This is the first time um, I have built anything on my own, um, except for um, our four-year-old. Um, and it's the same, you know, the rest of the world is also, it is, we just turned four uh, this month. Um, and I'll tell more about like rest of the world, you know, as, as we sort of, uh, continue, but yeah, I accidentally got into editing and I really, really enjoy it. Cause I think like I get to, I get to do something that I've like deeply believed in, which is telling stories from the ground, empowering people who know the issues and teaching them how to sort of like tell stories about their communities, which is something I think like that continues to lack in, in our international reporting, um, uh, apparatus uh, in Western media. So, yeah. Great. Oh, I, I thought I knew so much about you and I learned so much more. <laughs> um, I think we both have children turning four this year and then also with the rest of the world. Um, so, um, but something that you said that I wanted to piggyback off because this is Saja, um, that I also ended up in Bangladesh for the second time to do my reporting because of a Saja fellowship. So um, some of our programs are sort of like stagnant right now, but to anyone here, if you have an idea, if you you know just need some support financial and otherwise, like Sri was saying in the beginning, please reach out to us. We're kind of like figuring out like our programming moving forward, our scholarship and funding program. So we would love to hear from any of you that need help. So I just want to jump in and quickly uh, say that. Um, um, also wanna shift to Morgan and hear about your origin story. I think you also have a similar reporting, editing, producing, like multi-pronged career. So excited to hear about that. Yeah, I've, um, I've started, I've always been in television. Um, I started in the pre-internet era. Um, uh, took time off from school, uh, had a lot of credit built up and uh, figured I would be more uh, apt to use my time wisely getting a job than um, sitting in a bar and um, worked uh, actually in local news here in Washington about 31, 30, almost 32 years ago uh, when I was about when I was 19 or 20. Um, and that was really interesting. It was, it was we had a national broadcast. I worked in sports, but also did some local news and got a real feel for you know, uh, the, the, the underappreciated art of local reporting, which I think is so immensely important, in, especially at, in this day and age when local journalism is, is atrophying at a, at a geometric rate. Um, and then went from there to CBS News in New York uh, and worked on a variety of broadcasts there uh, and um, on Sunday morning on the weekend news, did some stuff for 60 Minutes um the evening news uh, all over the place and i was in an age and new york was much more affordable than where i could afford to uh live uh, very meagerly but also work as much as i wanted and they were very uh, enthusiastic about people who wanted to work 14 hours a day seven days a week um <laughs> and uh work for a variety of shows so i got a very good feel for that and then a correspondent i worked with there uh, in 1998, uh, went came. He was based here, and I'd work with him down here. Um, I'm originally from Virginia and DC area, and he uh, asked me to come to the News Hour. And at that point in time, in 1998, um, the News Hour was a, a very um, sleepy, small operation um, with exorbitantly long discussions and even longer tape reports that were, you know, 14 to 16 minutes long. Um, you know. <laughs> gestational almost. Um, and um, I slowly started, we worked in, I worked initially covering the media, which was a lot of fun. Um, it was the heyday of Monica Lewinsky and the, and uh, we covered a whole mess of media issues. And then I transitioned to working on our sort of news of day unit. Um, it's kind of just a breaking news, news of day, writing, editing pieces, um, uh, going out in the field a lot um, with reporters and, and camera crews. Uh, and then in about 2008, I transitioned. I had done some overseas reporting from the news hour during the second intifada, 
uh, in Israel and on the West Bank um, and uh, got a real taste for it then. And then in 2008, transitioned almost exclusively to foreign reporting. Um, and, you know, all the places Asmat referred to Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Ukraine, Egypt for the uprising and the revolution and, you know, everywhere in between Korea uh, and the DMZ when it was very hot in 2010-11. Um, and then did that for until about the end of 2015. Uh, and my boss, who um, had been at Reuters for some time, uh, decided to um, re resign for family reasons. And, and I thought about it and I said, you know, I really, I really kind of have carved a niche for myself here, um, kind of a, a big dog in a small yard, and I don't feel like sharing. <laughs> and they asked me if I wanted to be the editor. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. I'll put away my go bag for a little while, see if this works. If I don't like it, they said, look, give it, give it three or four months, see if you like it. If not, we'll post the job. Um, and um, they did post a job anyway, just for, you know, EEOC reasons and all that other stuff. But it's, um, you know, I kind of had an inside track. And after several months of doing it and working and really starting to build a bench of, of freelance overseas correspondents who work for us, and now I've got probably I don't know, 10 full time, not full time, but 10 who contribute on a regular basis to us, uh, both correspondents and producers and a, and a battery of camera people. I really started to like it. Um, and now I've been doing that for almost nine years uh, as the foreign editor here. Um, and we've got a wonderful correspondent named Nick Schifrin, also a Columbia, Columbia grad, um, undergraduate. Um, I think he and I are the only ones in our unit who did not go to Columbia J School. Um, <laughs> um, and I think I'm the only one in some respect who did not go to Columbia at all. Um, <laughs> so um, we've got a wonderful, wonderful, small but mighty unit uh, that churns out an enormous amount of news um, every day, sometimes two or three things a day. Um, but it's extraordinarily rewarding. And I mean, the, the foundational reason I got into journalism was it just looked fun. It looked like there's something new to do every day. You know, the notion that I would go in some place and sit down in front of my workstation and start typing into a TPS report like an office space made me wretch. And um, it just sounded like something that was cool. And there was always something interesting going on. And I wanted to, I, wa I not only wanted to see it, I wanted to witness it. And I wanted to tell people about it and let them know how important it was. And that's the really vital thing about the news hour to me and about, you know, a lot of the publications for whom Anup and, and Asmat and Sri have worked and you, Jenny, is we don't have to do stupid shit, um, to be perfectly blunt. We get the space and the, and the real estate to do important work. Um, you know, you don't have to stake out Kim Kardashian's house. Um, you know, I've, I've long been an admirer of, of Asmat's reportage. Um, her amazing reporting from Iraq about civilian casualties and in Syria is really kind of a benchmark in, in terms of that work. Um, and there's no other place to do that other than the New York Times or Frontline or PBS NewsHour, maybe 60 Minutes. Um, it's just, you know, we are extraordinarily lucky to do what we do. And I, I remember that every day. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to, to talking talking through our, our experiences and our what advice we have. And I'm very excited to hear your questions. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Jenny. Yeah, um, I think some of the takeaways from all your intros is that, A, there are so many different ways to get into journalism overall, but also foreign correspondence, and also a lot of bootstrapping, right? Like, a, 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 basically, all of you took a chance on something, whether it's going off to Pakistan, you know, switching your major, or choosing to take on another beat while you're at your job. So I think that's those are such important lessons for all of us to um, take on. Um, I want to start off with um, asking, so what does it mean to be a foreign correspondent today, right? Like Asma, what are you teaching your students? Um, Anoop, um, what, what, what is some guidance you're giving your reporters who are actually from all over the world and really reporting on everywhere in the world? Um, and same thing for you, Morgan, right? Like you're, you have um, your go-to um, uh, people on the ground. So um, I don't know who wants to, anyone can take it first, but like, what does that mean today? And how has it changed over the last decade or so? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Uh, and I often tell my students, like the, the foreign correspondent, as it was known, that as a role doesn't really exist today. It might exist in a few capacities or there might be a few jobs, but as, you know, a career, as a, you know, a viable path, I think our world has shifted. And in many ways, 
for the better, right? We are often hiring people in the countries um, where we are looking for reporting and it is people who live there who are not foreign to the area that are doing that reporting. Um, in some ways it's unfortunate. It's also that, you know, a lot of, you know, bureaus in different countries, these global news bureaus have closed down with cost cutting at different institutions. But, you know, what I tell my students and, you know, these are just to get as practical as I can, um, I wouldn't look at it as a, you know, I'm going to hop around different parts of the world, try to specialize, you know, you can start with one area. And, you know, every student in my course, for example, has an assigned country, and they get really local um, to that place. And that is something that I'd encourage you to do you, the way that economics of this often works today is that you are going to wind up probably being a freelancer on this path. And that means that you need to start applying for grants and resources. Um, you need to understand how to think about making this sustainable. So it's not just, you know, oh, I'm going to only ever be writing and publishing pieces and that's how I will make my money. But like a lot of people I know who start out in global reporting, you know, they have a little bit more diverse income coming in. So some of them might teach English in the country that they're living in, or they might work at, you know, a local paper as well, and then use or at a local TV channel and use some of the resources of that institution to help them with other reporting they're doing while they're also freelancing. You know, there are all different kinds of things. I know people who have written text for the hotels that they've stayed at and have gotten comped for, you know, some of their travel and um, travel costs. Um, a lot of times people will be sharing with other people. Um, so that kind of traditional concept of, you know, a well-paid correspondent bouncing the globe, um, it, it, it might exist for certain institutions that might happen if there's some specialized area of focus for that person. Um, but most of the time, that's not the case. And if you're trying to get your experience in a, in a part of the world that you're fascinated by, or interested in, you need to get local. And that means that you plant roots, you learn the language, you learn culture, you try to see the place through eyes of people who live there. Um, you know, you take what you can get and you work with others. And I think that's something that's also really beautiful um, is how collaborative it can be. Uh, you will often work with other freelancers, you'll pitch things together. And unfortunately, there's a lot of rejection. Um, even, you know, myself, like there was, um, I left a staff job and felt very strongly that the civilian casualties resulting from U.S. air operations in the war against ISIS um, was an underreported but fundamentally important story. And I pitched it to like a number of outlets and there was very little interest. And, you know, partly that's maybe the time period then where like people hadn't caught up to that reality. Part of it was also just that sometimes you have to do the work and show that it you know, you have to be able to demonstrate I've done this reporting. So I was doing a lot of reporting without, you know, a formal assignment. And a year into that um, is when I was able to land that story or get the commission from the New York Times Magazine. But it was like a year of pitching and being told no, even as like a veteran journalist or somebody who was experienced. So it is grim. It is dark. Um, but I'm going to, in the chat, I'm going to put some resources. Um, my website has, there's a password for it. I'll put the password in the chat as well but resources for freelancers and other guides. If you're interested in doing global reporting, um, you know, Facebook groups like the Vulture Club that you can join, other resources you might find really valuable. Thank you so much. I wish I had a list like that when I was <laughs> out there, um, but yes, thank you. Um, Anoop Morgan, either of you. Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, Osman's point is well taken that, you know, the, the, the days of the trench coat uh, trench coated uh, foreign correspondents standing in baritone speaking in front of parliament are, are, are not entirely over, but largely. I think one of the huge things in television that's changed for foreign correspondents over, over my time is what used to be um, traveling with about a thousand pounds of gear has diminished down to maybe a big suitcase, a laptop, and a camera. Um, you know, it used to be we would go overseas. And you would have uh, two cameramen, a uh, sound man, um, an edit pack, which was a mobile edit pack instead of a laptop. And then the, the, the evolution in technology has made foreign correspondence uh, a lot simpler in some ways. Um, the the, um, 
the real disintegration though of many parts of the world over the last 20 years especially has made it much harder and much more dangerous in a lot of ways um you know i remember the first time i got shot at um it was by the idf <laughs> um and um i i was kind of taken aback and now i just sort of you factor in that journalists are targets when you go to war zones um you know i was in syria a, a few days before jim foley was grabbed and i was in iraq when he was killed uh, and I've become close friends with his mother um, over the years. And it's a cautionary tale for a lot of us. Um, you know, I think one thing that I have really um, worked on as editor, at, a foreign editor at NewsHour is we've really gathered kind of a stable of very experienced journalists who do a lot of what Asmat was talking about. Some of them will write for print when they're not working for me. We have them under contract, but they're not exclusive. So, you know, they get paid and they've got insurance and that kind of stuff when they work for me, but it's not, I'm not, you know, dangling them out there and giving them a commission every month. They're working other jobs, other reporting stories, all, all that kind of other stuff. Some teach, you know, the whole nine yards, some do commercial work. Um, and it's, you know, it's, you have to be, I have never personally been a freelancer. Um, I've always had staff jobs, um, but it is something where you have to, um, and I talk to my people all the time about it is you have to be not just a triple threat. I mean, I have a lot of people who shoot, edit and report on camera, um, which is, you know, unheard of 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, and they are past masters at it. And it's really, it, it's more bang for the buck. Um, it makes things much more economical and they get more work because of it. Um, that's a really, those sets of skills. I al almost always ask people who come to me and I don't know them, do you shoot? Do you edit? Uh, and invariably, even most of the correspondents edit. Uh, they may not shoot, um, you know, uh, but I've got three or four who do shoot and produce and edit. And that's just, uh, it's huge value added. It's more money in their pocket. Um, so I can't encourage you guys enough to, to, really, to really focus on those skills if you're going into TV. And even for, for print, I mean, if you can shoot the, shoot the art that goes with your, your, your piece, um, you know, that's, that's a huge value added for, for editors who are looking to, frankly, be um, a bit frugal in this, in, in this environment, in this news economy, it's very tough. Um, but it's, um, you know, I've really, I have, I have had people who've come to me who have been dynamite reporters who had no real TV experience, um, who I have really kind of worked with and had other correspondents work with and really because they're so good. I mean, we have one marvelous correspondent um, who I started working with in 2016 um, named Nadia Drost, who um, who's uh, originally from um, Hungary, I think, and she was in Colombia and she and her husband were in Colombia and they brought me this beautiful story. He's a marvelous cameraman about the FARC and they had spent a lot of time in the jungle with with the Colombian rebels. And it was just magnificent, but she had never voiced a TV piece and she'd never really been on camera. So it took a lot. I recognized the talent and she later in one year won a Pulitzer, a Peabody and an Emmy for a piece she did for us. Um, you know, quite the triple threat there um, about uh, going through the Darien Gap. Um, you know, she's she's just tough as nails and sweet as the day is long, but she was very receptive to that. So, I mean, I think one thing, you know, and and if you're if you've all been to J school or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, be receptive to um, encouragement, be receptive to direction. Um, you know, I still take a lot of direction and I've been doing this a long time. Um, you know, really, you know, soak in the experience and soak in the knowledge that people who've been doing it longer than you have um, can impart because it's important. And it, it, makes your, it makes you more marketable. It makes your stuff more marketable. Uh, and, you know, when you come in someplace and somebody doesn't need to coach you how to do X, Y, and Z, that that just makes everything go more smoothly. Um, so I think I've been talking long enough and let's see what Anoop has to say. No, this, this has also been like, you know, very helpful for me to hear. I mean, um, I think I, I saw a real shift when I was at the Washington Post, um, you know, working as a digital editor. And I remember that moment, like August 2014, when I discovered the video of uh, the decapitation, um, James Foley's. I was the first, I like, I think in the newsroom, I was the first one to saw it. I immediately downloaded it uh, because things would get deleted. And we were covering that story. And I showed it to my editor, Doug Gell, and I said, like, hey, this looks real. And he's just like, he was stunned, right? I'd, I'd watched it for the first time. He came and he said, like, can you play it? 
this letter on my screen, like, you know, I played it once and then he called Marty Baron and said like, Marty, you have to see it. So I played it again. So in a moment of like 10 minutes, I think like I had like multiple editors walk to my desk and, and want to see that. And that was sort of like, it was a moment to me was also like international reporting, like the war reporting had, had changed. And ISIS was doing so much of, of this themselves that, you know, as, as you said, uh, Morgan earlier, that traditional form of foreign correspondence going to a war zone in a trench coat and kind of like doing that reporting and bringing back material. It, it did, you know, it, it doesn't exist anymore. Like everybody's doing their own storytelling. Right. So, so, so journalists are no longer safe. And I think like, you know, as um, you know, the kidnapping of Austin Tice kind of like took over the, even for mainstream institutions to kind of deploy freelancers without the safety and security and experience, I think that's gone down drastically. Like it's very hard to go out and kind of like string from a a, a complicated place because of the risks uh, involved in it. Um, the job that I do now is very different. I also like I think I got really exhausted from the 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 PTSD from dig digital media, like especially during the ISIS and the, the migrant crisis looking over dead bodies and just kind of like this very, very grim story. So I was very happy to kind of like, you know, move away from it for a little bit. And the work that I do now is very different. I, uh, you know, rest of the world covers business and technology, but from an international reporting perspective, we're on the ground. Um, our lens is really people, right? Like, so we're not kind of like writing stories about how much money somebody raised or like, you know, like the seed round and things like that. We're actually writing about the impact of tech on people. And one of the things we do is, you know, as Atma was saying, like we really lean on local journalists and that's kind of our motto. That's our ethos. It's something I like deeply believe in. And what I tell both journalists we're trying to hire, but also like, you know, students I speak to, it's like actually like go back to your home countries because there is a lot more opportunity to tell these stories um, from where you are. Because the world's also become a much smaller place because of technology, right? Like there is inherent interest in issues and topics and there are a lot more connect the dot stories that are happening across the globe. Um, in part because of migration, people moving, right? Like, I mean, I saw this like when I was at the Kathmandu Post that a huge chunk of the traffic was coming from the United States. Right. Like because we were we were able to tell these like stories that kind of appeal to the diaspora. Right. And I think it, it, it's just like the world's become a smaller place. And so so one of the things we do at the rest of the world is we kind of sometimes we act like a, a, a journalism school. Sometimes it's like a teaching hospital. Right. You, you kind of like create these cheat sheets for journalists who either never been to journalism school or only worked for local publications. So you kind of like, you know, you're teaching them a little bit of ethics, a little bit of like standards, a little bit of craft, a little bit of style and voice. So we give, you know, folks a cheat sheet in terms of like expectations. Um, and we, I mean, I think like 99% of our reporters are all local and they, they come from the countries that they were born in and like, you know, that they know really um, well, um, really good examples. I mean, there are some examples where uh, we've had like uh, American reporters who, you know, done what Asma referred to earlier, like, you know, go back to a country, learn the language, done fellowship. And we hired this like young reporter, uh, Megan Tobin, many, uh, well, many years, it's been four years. So like, you know, a few years ago uh, from the South China Morning Post, she was working there. Um, she was brilliant. She'd done like the Henry Luce program. Um, she spoke Mandarin and we hired her. She did some fantastic work here for a couple of years. And then Washington Post hired her and, you know, moved her to Taiwan. And then she left the Washington Post within a year to work for the New York Times. She's now at the New York Times, right? And I think those opportunities of kind of, again, going going back to basics, going to uh, a different country, learning the language, you know, really being familiar uh, with your issues and building a source space, I think that is still there. And that is like really, really um, helpful. And the other thing is like, you know, if you, if you, are, um, if you are in a country that is kind of, I mean, I hate to use this term, but like oftentimes a lot of like newsrooms will consider countries strategically important, right? Because for, for an American audience, and that's just the reality, right? Like because American readership cares about a particular country. Um, so I encourage people to sort of like just build a really strong um, sourcing muscle and angle muscle, right? Like how are you telling those stories differently uh, than anybody else? Um, and, you know, we've, we've hired fellows, 
uh, who've gone on to work for the Financial Times now, like, you know, reporters in Nigeria who worked with us for a year and, you know, moved on to another publication and is now like the FT correspondent in Lagos. We just finished uh, a reporting fellowship uh, that we did as a part of our Ford Foundation grant covering the intersection of labor and tech. Um, and uh, our report in Brazil just got a full-time job at The Intercept covering, um, you know, the, the, the uh, labor. Uh, we've hired one of these fellows to become our Southeast Asia reporter based in Vietnam. We had a role open up and, you know, we were able to hire her. Um, she's from Vietnam and she is now going to cover the region, work with other freelancers in Singapore and Indonesia and Bangkok um, to, to cover the stories for us. So these, these opportunities exist even for such like, you know, small niche publication like ours. Um, I think you have to kind of like start developing special interests you have to learn how to sort of like you know develop your own beats there was a time where i think like i think it still exists but as sort of like you know places like vice and mike and a lot of these kind of like general interests like newsrooms like shut her down uh the general reporting thing is like going away people are looking for more and more specialized reporting publications are looking for more and more specialized reporting and i just encourage you know young reporters or anybody who wants to do international reporting to sort of start building your specialty, right? Whether you're reporting about tech, whether you're reporting about business, whether you're reporting on politics, um, the start sort of like, you know, thinking about where your interests lie and like how you build your sourcing and like, you know, how you're writing kind of uniquely accessible stories um, for an audience that are far from where you live. I think it's similar to what Asmund was saying earlier, also like um, specializing, you can specialize in a region or specializing in a beat that you can carry on to several regions, right? Like if you are obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but if you um, have, uh, you know, basically obtained expertise in something, you can see if that same issue is happening in another region or in a different country, right? So that it seems like there's yeah. sort of multiple entry points my next question yeah. was going to be something that Vidatri also asked, which is um, about fixers. I don't know if everyone knows what the term fixer means. And I will uh, also link a, a story that I found very helpful um, um, in the chat. But basically, fixers traditionally were known um, as um, they sometimes were local journalists, sometimes were local translators, other people who kind of like helped foreign correspondents or Western journalists like navigate and get sources on the ground. Now, just like you were saying, Anoop, a lot of local journalists are now uh, reporting themselves for um, a lot of publications. Um, however, I, I do know from my own experience and others that, you know, fixers are still um, sort of like, a, <laughs> um, are, are still a thing. So A, do each of you find that term and that sort of role problematic and how do you navigate that, right? Like the difference between a fixer um, and a local journalist who you're collaborating with. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I I, I can kind of like you know, answer this first because we take both the term and like the practice of like, you know, how we uh, uh, deploy re local reporters like very, very seriously. Uh -huh. uh, there are no fixers at rest of world. Like, you know, we do sometimes have a day rate for a reporter's work and they get credit, right? Either at the bottom, but basically uh, our policy at rest of world is if you, if the reporting or the story is not possible without the involvement of that reporter in a particular place, right? They need to get a top byline. And oftentimes like, you know, um, whether it's a, a full-time reporter at Rest of World and if it's a matter of like a freelancer who kind of like, you know, did the reporting, I have insisted that the freelancer who's done the work from a place that was really kind of like integral to the piece get the lead uh, byline. I think it's important to acknowledge that because, uh, you know, we, the journalism industry for a long time kind of like, you know, took local reporters and, and, and for granted, right? And it's almost like you actually didn't get any credit yeah. Even though, like, you know, you knew that, like, you know, the stories were simply uh, uh, you couldn't achieve that reporting without their help. And I think, like, I've seen a shift, right? I mean, you see this, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, the Overseas Press Club did the award ceremony. And I think, like, you know, I've just seen in the past so many years, like, local reporters and reporters on the ground uh, be recognized as a part of the award-winning team because, organizations like Reuters and AP and the Times, they know that you cannot uh, do the kind of work in Ukraine or or Israel or Gaza, right? Like without the help of people on the ground. 
Uh, some some organizations are really good at it. Some organizations are still sort of like you know in transition. Um, but I feel that largely that that that, that culture is changing. Morgan, did you, I think you wanted to talk? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I differentiate between the two. Um, you know, there are certainly, we work with a ton of local journalists. Um, you know, Ukraine, we've had a producer who, when Nick Schifrin worked for Al Jazeera America, first met in 2014. Um, I had a producer, a young journalist, I think then she was 22, but very, very sharp, who was my local producer then. Uh, and we still work with both of them, um, one of them more than the other. Um, my Gaza producer is a guy I've been working with more than a decade. And, you know, when I woke up, I was actually on vacation on October 7th, but I still woke up at 4.30 in the morning and saw what had happened. And he was my first call. Phone didn't go through, but I got him on WhatsApp and he's been working with us almost every day since. Um, you know, it's re relationships you cultivate. Um, you know, I, I go back and I think about the term fixer. I've really only ever worked with one fixer, and that was in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And he was not a journalist. He was a legitimate fixer. Um, he had been a CIA asset in the 60s. Uh, he was a he was out of a he was just out of a novel. He was this amazing guy. He was his parents were Jordanian. They had moved there in the 30s. Um, he was the kind of guy I said, look, I called them before we got down there to drive into Haiti. And I said, I need a 5000 watt generator, 100 gallons of fuel. I need 30 gallons of water. Uh, I need um, two coolers with 100 pounds of ice and I need two pickup trucks and we're showing up tomorrow night. Uh, and he rolled up to the airport with all that stuff, and it, and it was it was an amazing thing to see. And that was a legitimate fixture. Um, you know, I I don't I don't use the term when it comes to the local reporters we work with. Um, they're integral. I mean, we don't get anything done without them, um, and they're incredibly vital to what we do. So I mean, it's it's um, I have you know um, kind of a, a, a coterie of them too. Some of them we put on camera. Um, some of them will report out their own stories and give them to us. So it's it's a symbiotic relationship. So when Nick or, or another foreign uh, correspondent I have goes to a certain place, they'll work with them. But, you know, they're often pitching me their own stories. So it's, you know, it's a very symbiotic, multifaceted role. Yeah. And I, I just maybe will add a little bit on this, that the, this is a term that still gets thrown around a lot. And um, it's really important that you ask the people you're working with, like, how they want to be referred to, how they want to be talked about. And I do have like, just, uh, I can show you this a little bit very quickly, briefly, but you know, it's something I talk about with my students um, that comes up often is sort of like when, when you're working with local journalists, what can that look like? You know, what do these terms mean? Um, you know, and, and how should you sort of think through what responsibilities might be, but like in general, there are different categories that people who you might be working with locally might fall into the work that they're doing. So there's that kind of logistics work that I think Morgan was just kind of describing as well, um, which can be, you know, helping you navigate red tape or bureaucracy on the ground. And like, that is very much like logistics. There's a lot of cultural and linguistic expertise that people will help with. And that goes beyond mere translation. You know, I have um, hired, you know, a student at the University of Mosul. She helped me sort of like dress locally in the ways that I wouldn't pick up on, like making sure like a single tuft of hair didn't peek out from my hijab and having a thing under my hijab, you know, things like that. So I would stand out less. Um, and then you have like the journalistic and editorial um, outputs. And the, the reason why I think it's important to sometimes delineate responsibilities is so that you can more accurately describe what someone does. And when you see that they're, especially in these categories in the middle or on the right, like that they need to be referred to as, you know, a journalist. And you need to think very thoughtfully about how you're working with them. And like, these are the terms that I think like, anybody who does this kind of work or is going to work with locals on the ground that they center respect, relevance, responsibility, and reciprocity to that. And there's a lot more to this if you are working with locals or if you're going to be the person who is going to be working with a Western outlet, how you can advocate for yourself. So if you have questions about that, I do have, you know, um, different kinds of, um, you know, advice on how you can advocate for yourself, how you can set fair rates, um, how you can ensure that you aren't exploited, because unfortunately, there's been like a very dangerous past in our industry of, of, of that kind of colonial era of reporting where you had these bureaus where people would sweep in and hire locals and then not give them a byline or credit or any evidence of their contributions. And um, 
you know, I, unfortunately, I think you still have that that might exist in some places and corners, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we need to prevent. Thank you so much for that resource. It's amazing. Um, I think we only have a couple of minutes left. So I want to, um, um, address a news's question because I think it's a really good one. Um, I'm curious about how you vet your sources in foreign regions, especially when dealing with sources from groups such as ISIS, the Taliban, and other terrorist organizations. How do you ensure the legitimacy of your sources to avoid issues similar to what occurred with the New York Times caliphate? Yeah, that's a loaded, really good question. Um, if we could get to it quick and dirty, that would be great. Can't wait for Osma to answer this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And then we all know who we want to answer. Um, look, I mean, that avoiding that shouldn't be that hard because I think that there were very, uh, and I, I have to be careful about what I say because this is a, the work, I mean, I'm a, a reporter at the Times as well. Um, so you can read at length in the Times and elsewhere about what led to that particular podcast. And I would say that, you know, the, the advice I can give any journalist is that don't be swept away by a sensationalist narrative. Um, don't put narrative or story above facts. And that's so basic a, a news that I don't think that this is something that you're, it, it's, I think that it is truly, that is a sort of low bar to be measuring against, but with sources, I think you need to consider their motivations, agendas. Are you able to corroborate things? Um, you know, how much does this play into or feed into other narratives that may not necessarily be accurate? And, you know, what are you doing to be representative of the issue at hand? So like uh, something for me that's really important and maybe it's more attuned to investigative journalism, which is that like, I want to know the net impact of something. I want to know what a majority of the things that are happening are. And I'll focus on that rather than an anomaly, rather than an exception um, or something that it isn't reflected in those patterns. Um, and so certainly I think you would just apply all the great skills of reporting and not be swept away by narrative. Yeah, um, maybe one last question. Um, I think we have time for that. Um, how on earth do you manage burnout, desensitization, and trauma from your work? Yes, I really want to know the answer to that question. Uh, something that I do that I encourage all of my people to do and everyone at my show is therapy. Um, you know, I have pretty acute PTSD from almost getting killed a few times. Um, didn't treat it for a long time and finally came to a head. Um, I think the, the more open you are with your colleagues and the more open you are Hold on, I gotta take this one. Very sorry, I'll be. I I can just kind of like you know, pick that up. Um, you know, I come from a culture where talking about therapy is uh, a type. You know, it's a it's a stigma. And um, last a couple of years ago, maybe like a year and a half ago, um, here I mean, it's not just this job; it's a continuation of like everything I've done. The burnout is so real. Um, you know, we had a child in the middle of COVID and, you know, launching a startup and like, you know, trying to make sure like, you know, your work is kind of like visible. It was incredibly stressful. And I think like at one point I told my boss, the founder, um, that um, instead of a raise, like, you know, it's a nonprofit, we're not going to get raises every year. And I basically said, like, can I, can I get comp for my therapy? And like, I started seeing a therapist for the first time in life and it was life changing. I, I do before that, my therapy was cooking. I still do a lot of cooking. It really helps me. I actually spend like hours in the kitchen, um, you know, literally chopping onions and, you know, but doing it the old way. And it, I find that really fulfilling. Um, but working out, talking to a therapist regularly and cooking, and that's how I stay sane, honestly. Yeah, I would, I would add one other thing. Uh, you don't have to see everything. You don't have to look at everything. I know... You know, I, I've talked to a, a colleague at the Times about this, and she and I traded notes, you know, a long time ago about Syria. I mean, I'd been there, she'd been there, we'd been there multiple times, um, you know, and that was the, the height of the Civil War. And, you know, after a certain amount of time, you know, you don't have to witness things in person to be really deeply affected by them. And I know mm -hmm. for, for my own part, there's a lot of stuff I just don't look at now. I know yeah. what it looks like. I know I've seen it, but I don't need to see it now. I don't need to add to that catalog. And you shouldn't be afraid to tell people, look, you know, I, I, I just can't. 
Um, you know, it's part of the job. Um, it's a necessary part of the job, but, you know, looking at 50 pictures of dead children uh, is not always really necessary. Um, there is a lot of horror in the world um, and you can only really take so much unless you're psychotic and, you know, we don't want those people in the business. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of, um, you know, I would echo everything they said, but there are also a lot, there's more attention on this issue now, especially when it comes to journalists than there used to be. So there's no newer resources. If you're on the resources page that I'd sent earlier in the syllabus that's there, there's a lot of, um, um, links on how to take care of yourself, how to think through things. There's also, um, so if you're on that resources page, there's also mental health trainings and resources, and also there's subsidized. Um, so if you're in, yeah, if you go up to resources, um, uh, yep. And then you scroll down to first, just even this first sources of support sheet. If you click that, you'll see there's a whole tab on mental health resources and grants. Um, so if you go down to the bottom, yeah, exactly. Um, here are different emergency funds for therapy. There's also different mental health exercises. None of this is, you know, a, a total fix, but there are resources that can help in the syllabus as well. There are resources on readings. I just popped one into the chat on recognizing secondary trauma as a primary issue um, that will be, you know, that I think is helpful, but you need to know what causes you stress, what your triggers are. They can be different from person to person. And Things like therapy, journaling, um, and thinking about assignments before you go on them, during and after, and having a plan for each. I'd also really recommend the DART Center for Trauma and Journalism is a great resource on this subject. Um, hi, folks. I'm just stepping in here to be the bad guy to wrap up this incredible session. I, I know that uh, some of our speakers will have to leave immediately, but if one or two want to stick around and maybe answer couple of extra questions that would be great but I did promise them that they can get back to their day jobs at two o'clock eastern uh, so let's just uh, very quickly if uh, if uh, Azmat you want to just give us a final thought before we let you go oh this is fantastic you guys are incredible for being interested in these subjects I'm happy to continue talking if anyone has questions or I think the resources might be a good place to start and um, you know I would just say that I can tell from your questions that you aspire to great ethics and, um, you know, approaching this with the sensitivity that it requires. And that gives me a lot of hope. So thank you for everything that, that you're bringing to this. And um, I, hope to, I hope to be reading you and, and looking at your reporting from different parts of the world soon. Yeah, I would just Excellent. Second. Asma, before, yeah. Go ahead, sorry, Glenn Morgan. I would just echo. But one second, if I, I want to see, see if Asma, sorry, I want to see if Asma has to leave. If she does, can we do a group photo and then just keep yeah, talking if that's sure, okay? Yeah, sure. All right. So if everyone can just look at the screen uh, and camera, not the screen, the camera. Ready? One, two, three. All right. Let me see if all the eyes are open. Let's see here. Okay. And then everybody turn on your camera so you can be with in a photo with uh, everybody here. That's great. And obviously optional. And then we're going to, I know Azmat will have to leave and maybe others as well, but we can chat a, to chat a little bit. This is like, you know, meet the press as overtime or whatever. <laughs> this, that's what this could be. All right. We're going to take a screenshot. Everyone smiling, looking at the lens. One, two, three. All right. Thank you so much, Azmat. Uh, good luck with everything you're doing. And thank you for all you do every day for uh, the world of journalism and your support of Saja has been amazing. Thank you. I've got to run too, Sri, but I'm really heartened by the, the the questions I saw passing through the chat. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, although I don't check that that often. Uh, and that's just mtill, M-T-I-L-L, at newshour.org if you want to shoot me a note. So feel free. Um, more than happy to carry on the conversation, but I've got to go to an editorial meeting now. Um, Sri, thank you. Jenny, thank you. Anoop, great to see you. Great uh, to meet you. Azmat. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, one, one thing I wanted to say earlier, I think like, you know, something that's really helped me, um, you know, starting from my days as a student is, uh, you know, I call it like building your personal board of advisors. It's obviously like your group of mentors, right? But especially like, you know, regardless of like, you know, what field, like what aspect of journalism, like you want to be in, I think mm -hmm. the world's like small enough again that like, I think you should have a board of advisor for yourself, right? That's how you succeed. You know, that's how you sort of like move in your career, like whether you need to sort of like, you know, change tracks or whether you need to sort of like ask advice about 
compensation and salaries. I think it's like really useful to have a team of mentors to kind of like, you know, lean on. And I think um, it's encouraging when like a lot of young people sort of like reach out and ask for advice. Uh, but I think like it's also sort of, I see less and less of that is happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just encourage people who who want to be in the business to just kind of like lean on people you admire, people you want to sort of like you know, emulate, people you see are doing the kind of work that you want to do. Um, that's helped me a lot. And I think, I mean, again, like, you know, uh, I, I can't thank Saja uh, uh, enough for, for helping me on this journey. She knows this. She saw me as a, I think like a 21 year old, you know, student, like from Tennessee. It's like, I want to be part of Saja. So um, yeah. So th thank, thank you for being, being here all along. You're muted, Sri. Sorry, I want to say to Anoop and to everybody who's watching, like I have seen Anoop go from that 21 year old uh, to editor in chief. And obviously not everyone's going to have that career and not everyone will want that career. But one of the things he said early, think about editing as a career, as opposed to everyone wants to be kind of the star foreign correspondent. Mm -hmm. But that editing part is also so important and, and, and gives you more opportunities. Like if you want to be yeah. television, right, Jenny, you know this also that when you think about, oh, I want to be a TV star, right? But a lot of the power in television is you heard from Morgan, it's behind the scenes when you're actually getting to, uh, and there are also just many more producer jobs than there are reporter jobs. There are more off-camera jobs than there are on-camera jobs, things like that to think about as you're doing this. But so many great questions and comments coming in. I hope if you have a minute, and I know um, there will be others who want to talk too, but uh, we have, I know there's somebody watching here today who has a great insight, information, knowledge about a big international story, but they're living in India and they might feel like it's really hard to kind of pitch a story like that, that's bi-continental, et cetera. Any advice on pitching to you or to anyone else? Uh, how do you yeah. prove how good you are when you're so far away? Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, pitching, pitching is an art. It's sort of, you know, you have to be just as good at writing a pitch as you would in writing a story. But I think like, you know, my, my advice would be to be very specific right oftentimes like I think especially for us where like where English is a second language and you're not used to the idea of like pitching western editors we are very like long-winded right like we don't get to the meat of it but tell tell editors what you have what you know what kind of access you have I think the word access comes up a lot in newsrooms right like can this person does this person have access to execute that story sometimes a good idea is not enough you have to sort of like explain like you know what kind of access you have and how are you going to accomplish that? So be specific, write a short note, follow up. I think following, you know, people don't follow up enough. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of being one of those people who don't respond to email for seven weeks. But when I'm in an airport, I will be like, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, I was traveling and then I will actually respond. So I think editors are interested in stories, right? Like we need good stories. So I would just um, write short, concise notes, be very specific and follow up. And I would say, why why are you different? Why are you so good at this? Why should you be the one uh, yeah, writing exactly. the story? And and and, yeah. and that expertise matters. And by the way, Anoop, this is uh, on my chart here. You see, build that board of advisors, and I had that there you go. Uh, yeah. in in two thousand uh, onwards. I've been saying, you know, think about think about that. So that's great advice. I Anoop, probably we'll got go. that from you at one point. So yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for having but me. We'll, we'll let you go, everyone, thank for you. tuning in. Bye. Thank you. And uh, Jen, you did an amazing job. Your thoughts. Let's debrief if we can, just a couple of minutes. Yeah. And then let anybody who has a question jump in too. Yes to everything. And yes, learning how to pitch is absolutely the key to everything. And also, I just want to touch on something that happened to me today. I am later on speaking to a professor um, at a pretty, I don't know if I can talk about it yet. So I, I just want to like kind of gloss over it, but um, who was just simply looking for a journalist who had been on the ground in Bangladesh for a project that he's putting together. And so we're going to be speaking soon. And just like one of the ways you can diversify streams of income, streams of expertise, and also, you know, um, regarding pitching, that's the kind of thing you talk about in your pitches, right? Like, yes, this is the story. These are the sources I have. 
And this is why I'm equipped to do this because A, I've done this, or I have cultural um, insight. I have, you know, personal insight, um, something of that nature, something that just really makes you stand out, especially if you're first starting out. Obviously, when you're experience you can list all of the things but when you're first starting out you can say you know I've embedded myself into into this story in this way or this is the culture that I come from or I've done extensive research and I've talked to xyz people already so really I, I find that that is what always impresses editors to so put that in your pitches for sure great so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the recording 